My husband of 50 years passed away last November, 10 months ago. Basically, my life fell apart. It went into broken pieces. I felt unsafe in a landscape that was unpredictable. And I felt vulnerable. I ran to four havens. I thought they were havens. The first were my friends who surrounded me with love and care. And the second and third was my music. As a composer and as a performer pianist, which I will share with you later. The fourth was the jigsaw puzzle. You'll find out about that later. So my friends came over in droves, five a day sometimes, for a few weeks. And then afterwards, they kind of petered out. They had to go back to their husbands, their partners, their homes, offices, whatever. And I did not want to be alone. So I would call them. Can you come over Thursday for lunch, Friday for dinner, Saturday overnight? Begging, which is not easy to do. You know, it puts you in a vulnerable spot when you do that. But I did not want to be alone. So I ran to the second haven, which was my composition. I've been a composer for 67 years and created a pretty rich and beautiful life with that work. Monday, nothing happened. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, nothing. And that really frightened me because this was my work. This is what I did. So I started thinking about this word vulnerability, which we all experience at one time or another. But it's, it's really interesting. There's two types of vulnerability. One is you have no choice. For example, if you're walking in the park and a bear comes out, it's not your choice. You didn't invite him. You didn't want to ask him to share your sandwich with you. No choice. I had no choice when and how and where my husband was going to die. The last year was formidably difficult because I didn't have any choices there, except to make him as comfortable as possible. So then I started thinking about being a composer and vulnerability. I've made a lot of choices there that put me in vulnerable situations. Here's the thing. As a classical composer, you have this script. It's called a score in music. And you put your soul into this script, which is an architectural blueprint in detail, very detailed. And you pass it to a conductor, to a player, to an ensemble, and you wait. Because they have to learn it, and they have to decide how they feel about it. Terribly vulnerable wait for me. Because the reaction could be, I don't get it. I don't actually like it. Or, it's kind of nice. I, I kind of like it to, wow, this is a fantastic piece. I'm going to play it a lot. You want that reaction. <laughs> Doesn't always happen. Then, these are the midwives who pass this on to the audience. You, the listeners, bigger li group of listeners. And you wait for their reaction, which goes from, don't get it, actually don't like it, like it, love it. You're waiting for that, too. So I've experienced all of these reactions over a period of 67 years. And I'm going to give you one that's quite uh, dramatic. It's kind of funny and kind of sad. I was appointed composer in residence with a
big and, and harsh maybe, beautiful maybe, and it's, it's a very visceral experience for most composers. Um, so during this run-through, this curmudgeonly old violinist in the back row of the first section, he, he, want, he was retiring very soon, and uh, he decided at this moment, there's a pause and, and there's a silence in the, in the piece, he decided at that moment he was going to let out a loud and long burp. The orchestra went into peals of laughter, of course, and I went into tears. <laughs> because I have a sense of humor, but this wasn't funny. Because I thought they were making fun of my piece. It really, it really hurt, hurt. That's an extreme example, but I've been through many other smaller examples of that kind of vulnerability. Um, so when you have a choice of vulnerability, you actually grow. I think. That's something I learned through this, preparing for this talk. Um, when I couldn't compose anymore, I ran to the piano. I used to be a professional pianist, decent pianist, and um, I joined my old friends that I grew up with. Bach, Beethoven, Chopin, Debussy, those iconic composers whose music still lives on. And I found a beautiful, safe, ordered haven. And I loved it. I couldn't wait to get to the piano. I'm going to share one of those experiences with you. Um, Chopin's Prelude in E Minor. It's a short piece that descends, but kind of tensely. The chords are not quite resolved twice. And it bursts out at one point. I guess Chopin said, you know, enough of the descent. Let's, let's, let's break this up a little bit. And then it goes down, and at the end, there are these three beautiful, relaxing, comforting, resolving chords. I have an image also that might or might not help. I did a deep sea dive in the Bahamas. And, you know, you put a tank on your back, and you go down, and the water gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And, and you're relying on this tank to breathe. It's intense, at least for the first time you do it. And then you hit the bottom floor, and there's this beautiful other world there. It's filled with color and algae and all kinds of fish and landscapes you've never seen before. It's really quite beautiful. So you forget for a moment the tension that you just, it's a kind of a haven for deep sea divers, I guess. So here's Chopin's prelude at E minor.
And that was the worst performance I've done in the last three weeks. I'm sorry. See, I was trying to play it from memory, and I haven't played from memory in 30 years. I guess it's the size of this audience or something. I don't know. I apologize. But I wanted to take the risk of trying. Um, so my fourth haven was the jigsaw puzzle. What's the jigsaw puzzle got to do with grief or vulnerability? Not much, but it has a lot to do with a haven that I found. I couldn't wait to get to the jigsaw puzzle after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner, just, just go and... And I was trying to figure out what the obsession with this thing was. You know, here it is. There's this picture, and they cut it all up, and they put it into pieces. And you're supposed to put it back together again. And you have a piece, and it goes somewhere. It's a fact. It has one place in that puzzle. You just have to find it. So you look, you know, and, you tr and sometimes it takes a minute, sometimes 15 minutes. And you, something about putting this broken picture back together again, I guess it's sort of like me trying to put my broken life back together again. It's just very comforting, very comforting. Um, I'm going to end with a piece I wrote for my husband, Jeff, who I have not talked about at all or our 50 years together, because I can't. Just saying those two sentences brings the grief back up. So I'm going to instead play the piece that I wrote for him. It's called Love Letter, and it's short. Thank you for listening.